Whoops. And let's get this up. And all right, guys. We are going to start by talking about. All right. Let's look at these five questions. All right. And then, like I said, if we run out of time on the video, I'm going to kind of or the the um, story. I'll kind of shorten it up for you. I may skip a couple of parts. Uh, but I'll make sure we get the main thing. So we got five questions we want to think about as we go through this. Okay, first of all, what are some of the hallmarks of Hemingway, Hemingway's style? I've already told you a couple of them. He writes very short sentences. You'll see it. They also don't feel like they connect well a lot of the time. You know, stuff that you're told you can't do, but he can because, well, he's a professional writer, and we're all just trying to get by. So um, are these effective for you as a reader? Do you find them to be more problematic for you personally? I mean, that's a personal question. And I said, don't worry, we're going to get the polar opposite in a couple of days when we read Faulkner. Faulkner's going to be the opposite. And these two constantly hated each other's writing style and liked to critique each other. Um, and they both are very different. And you know what? They both have their strengths. They really do. Um, I want so bad to like Hemingway. I mean, that is the goal. Because, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm a guy English teacher. You're supposed to love Hemingway. I just don't, mainly. I like some of his war stuff. But like I said, I read this complete book of his short stories. I don't think there was maybe two in here I liked. The rest of them I was like, just not my thing. I, I appreciate what he's doing, but just it, I didn't connect with it the way I do with some things. I honestly connect with Faulkner more, and I don't like Faulkner's style as much, but I just I like what he was doing better. So the second one it says Hemingway's part of a group of artists and writers who grew increasingly frustrated with the war, world in general, the war that was going on, and also with this country. They just didn't like some of the policies. This caused many of them to become expatriates. That is spelled correctly, okay? All right, I know Patriots got O in it, Mr. Morris. Not that version. It doesn't because it's not what it means. <laughs> okay, they would call them expats. They would shorten it down. An expatriate is a person who has moved to another country and lives there, but still is a citizen of their former country. So Hemingway was still a U.S. citizen, but he lived in Spain, uh, Spain, Italy, maybe. But he lived over there in Europe for a while. Okay, maybe France. I don't remember. Somewhere in Europe for a while. Okay, um, they talked about it in the video. So how does this work reflect the disillusionment that these people felt? So we're going to look for a disillusionment, meaning just kind of a disappointment, like general just depression over the way the world works. We're going to see that very easily in this story. You be on the lookout for it. Three, how do we as Americans overall historically view the war? All right, I'm not asking what you think. I'm asking what you think about America in general, how we feel about warfare. Which war, Mr. Morris? Just war. Okay, any of them. Oh, it's still on. I just have that turned off. Yeah, is it just black? Yeah, when it's like that, I, I, I've turned it off to save power. But it's still on. Thank you for reminding me, though. At least I think it is. Well, let's check. Now you got me wondering. Yep, there I am. Okay. It's nothing like looking at yourself in, in those videos later and being like, gosh, you think it would make me want to lose weight or something. It never has. So, I mean, it does while I'm watching. Then I'm like, but Burger King's so good. So um, this is how do we feel about it today versus in general how we have. You can say we feel the same way. All right, you don't have to say that there's any difference. Maybe you think there is. Again, that's up to you. Um, how does this work? No, nope, sorry, wrong, wrong one. How does Hemingway's work line up with traditionally held American beliefs about war? So is it pro-war? Is he anti-war? Just kind of read into it and see. Don't make a mistake of assuming that just because he fought in the world war, he's pro-war, though. Okay, remember that. I'm not saying he's not, but just don't ignore that and just jump to conclusions, okay? Four, what point is made about the letter that comes with the medal? That one's an interesting little side note. I told you Hemingway likes to hide a lot of messages in his, in his writing. That's one of them. He's going to make a comment about writing, not about war, not about disillusionment, but about writing that's hidden in that. And then finally, uh, the last one up here, it says, Hemingway loves to leave a lot of things unsaid in his work, making it look pretty simple but requiring a lot of work from readers to find the true depth of the work. What are some underlying unsaid things that could be dug out of this work, and why do you think writers use this style? A lot of them do, in fact. Uh, and a lot of them are co more, the people that came after Hemingway are literally just trying to copy him. Uh, it's part of it. It's also about making you have to work. Reading should not be a passive activity. Most of you struggle with it because you treat it as such. All right? You're used to reading things that are way below your intelligence level and your reading level, so you can do it passively. You can, it's like watching a comedy on TV. You're not required to think about that. But then you do something like my wife put on Shutter Island the other day. And I was like, I've seen this movie six times and I'm still confused. So I have to sit there and concentrate really close. Like, is this real or not? Well, what part of this is right and what part's not? I mean, you have to really pay attention to it, and that requires you to think and you stop and talking about it with people and saying, like, wait, what? Is, this, is he dreaming or is that part real? That's kind of like this type of writing. It requires you to approach it that way, to be an active reader versus a passive reader that's just looking at it like, you know, it's just a story, okay? 
You're going to see that really quick in here. All right, so let's look at the story on page uh, 801, okay? Now, look at this first paragraph. And again, I might jump around a little bit so we can get out of here by, what time do we go here, 2.13? All right, when the bell rings, we still get a few minutes. Don't rush out because we're not going to be done, I promise. I'm, I'm trying to get there. All right, let's look at this first paragraph, though, and look at how I told you it was short. Be on the lookout for it, and look how the sentences don't connect. In the fall, the war was always there, but we did not go to it anymore. It was cold in the fall in Milan, and the dark came very early. Then the electric lights came on, and it was pleasant along the streets looking in the windows. There was much game hanging outside the shops, and the snow powdered in the fur of the foxes, and the wind blew their tails. The deer hung stiff and heavy and empty, and small birds blew in the wind, and the wind turned their feathers. It was cold fall, and the wind came down from the mountains. It, it sounds very listish. Some of it's connected. Like when he says, then the electric lights came on, that ties those sentences together. But a lot of it is just like sentence, 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 and they're not really directly tied together. That's his writing, very much so. And sometimes it doesn't, I mean, he's like, get, get it to the smallest possible you can to say what you need to say. There's no reason to drag it out. There's no reason to beat people over the head with all these extra words. Just get to the point, which, you know, that's not a bad style, all right? It says, we were all at the hospital every afternoon, and there was different ways of walking across the town through the dusk to the hospital. Two of the ways were alongside canals, but they were long. Anyway, always, though, you crossed a bridge across a canal to enter the hospital. There was a choice of three bridges. On one of them, a woman sold roasted chestnuts. It was warm standing in front of her ch charcoal fire, and the chestnuts were warm afterwards in your pocket. The hospital was very old and very beautiful, and you entered through a gate and walked across a courtyard and out a gate on the other side. There were usually funerals starting from the courtyard. Sentences like that, like, what? <laughs> you know, just all, randomly, here's this, this really beautiful courtyard you walk through. There's a gate, there's a courtyard, then another gate, and you're in the hospital. By the way, funerals often started in this courtyard, and he doesn't elaborate on that at all. Just moving on. But when you start thinking about it, a hospital is a place you go to. You know, it's supposed to be getting better, but the fact that there's a lot of funerals starting from here, think about what that actually means. There's a lot of death here instead of a lot of healing. But you've got to slow down and think about that. And you, you, that's why you have to read it carefully. You can't just go through it like you would most things we read. This is beyond the old hospital were the new brick pavilions. And there we met every afternoon and were all very polite and interested in what was the, mat what was the matter and sat in the machines that were there to make so much difference. Now, you could have put that in quotation marks. <laughs> he doesn't really mean they do. The doctor came up beside the machine where I was sitting and said, what did you like to do best before the war? Did you practice the sport? I said, yes, football. Good, he said. You will be able to play football again better than ever. Okay. We're going to see this with these doctors. They're not very honest. Look, if you ever have, there's one injury you can have in sports that I know of where they do, the, when they fix it, you could potentially be better. There's only one I know of. Everything else, you, you, get, you blow out your knee and they fix it, you're not going to be a better running back. Uh, Tommy John can sometimes make you a better pitcher. That's it. It's the only one I know of. And that's not a guarantee. Operates on your elbow, isn't it? Yeah, my brother does. Yeah. So I'm not sure why it is it makes it stronger. I guess it just makes that so that you can throw better. It's you know, that that ligament and stuff is stronger, but it only happens like with the like this rare. Yeah, it's rare, but it's the only one I mean, I've never seen a running back who had knee surgery and all of a sudden now he's like just I'm killing it now. <laughs> I mean you're not it's not gonna happen. So and this was back in nineteen, seventeen, eighteen, something like that. So you know that's definitely not the case. Um it says, my knee did not bend, and the leg dropped straight down from the knee to the ankle without a calf, and the machine was to bend the knee uh, and make it move as if riding a tricycle, but it did not bend yet, and instead the machine lurched when it came to the bending part. <laughs> the doctor said, that will all pass. You are a fortunate young man. You will play football again like a champion. And the next machine was a major who had a little hand like a baby's. He winked at me when the doctor examined his hand, which was between two leather straps that bounced up and down and flapped the stiff fingers and said, and I will, will I too play football, Captain Doctor? He had been a very great fencer, and before the war, the greatest fencer in Italy. Now, this guy's important, but Hemingway's going to do something really interesting. He's going to introduce this guy who's kind of joking and laughing and a really nice, uh, good-hearted man. And then we're going to have another story that comes up, and then we're going to bring this guy back in a little bit, okay? But he's Italian. He is, he's in Italy at this hospital. This is not, he's an American soldier, but he's in an Italian hospital, okay? Um, since the doctor went to his office in a back room and brought a photograph which showed a, little, a hand that had been withered almost as small as the major's before he had taken a machine course and after it was a little larger, the major held the photograph with his good hand and looked at it very carefully. A wound, he asked? <coughs> An industrial accident, the doctor said. Very interesting, very interesting, the major said, and handed it back to the doctor. So you have confidence? No, said the major. He doesn't think it's going to do anything. 
Uh, but whatever. There were three boys who came each day and who were about the same age as I was. Excuse me, they were all three from Milan. One of them was to be a lawyer, one was to be a painter, and one had intended to be a soldier. And after we were finished with the machines, sometimes we walked back together to the Cafe Cova, which was next door to the Scala. So here's the thing. We've got our, our narrator here, who's an American soldier, and three Italian soldiers. These guys were all soldiers at one point. Um, they all are the same age. They've all been through the same stuff. There's a lot of reasons they should have a connection. I want you to see how that changes. We walked a short way through the co communist quarter because we were four, all four together. The people hated us because we were officers, and from a wine shop, someone called out, uh, yeah, y'all don't want to hear me attempt Italian, but he basically says down with officers as we passed. Another boy who walked with us sometimes made us made us five who wore a black silk handkerchief across the, his face because he had no nose then and his face was to be rebuilt. He had gone out to the front from the military academy and been wounded within an hour after he had gone into the front line for the first time. What bad luck. This kid graduates from a military academy, he goes out to his first battle, within an hour he's wounded and pulled out and that's it. Military career over. They rebuilt his face but he came from a very old family and they could never get the nose exactly right. He went to South America and worked in a bank. But this was a long time ago, and there we did not any of us know how it was going to be afterward. We only knew then that there was always the war, but that we were not going to go to it anymore. We all had the same medals, except the boy with the black silk bandage across his face, and he had not been at the front long enough to get any medals. So these are going to be medals of valor or bravery, and they've all got them. All right? they're, they're given by the Italian government. So again, another reason these guys should all be connected. The tall boy with a very pale face who was to be a lawyer had been a lieutenant of art of some city, and had three medals of the sort, and we each had one of. He had lived a very long time with death and was a little detached. We were all a little detached, and there was nothing that held us together except that we met every afternoon at the hospital. Although as we walked to the cova throughout the tough part of town, walking in the dark with light and singing coming out of the wine shops, and sometimes having to walk into the street when the men and women would crowd together on a sidewalk so that we would have to, had to jostle them to get by, we felt held together by there being something that had happened that they, the people who disliked us, did not understand. Now he can write long sentences, thus that one, but he's saying he feels like they don't have anything in common, although we're looking at it like of course they do, they have a ton in common. But he's like, you know, when we're going, the thing that united us is that we've been through stuff that none of these people did. So that's the separator for him. But there's going to be a change in this. Since we ourselves all understood the cova where it was rich and warm and not too brightly lighted and noisy and smoky at certain hours. And there were always girls at the tables and the illustrated papers on a rack on the wall. The girls at the cova were very patriotic and I found that the most patriotic people in Italy were the cafe girls and I believe they are still patriotic. Okay, I'm not sure what he's trying to say there but I'm guessing on this one, okay? The cafe girls, the girls that hang around the cafe probably hanging around soldiers are for sure they're all about soldiers. I don't know if it's so much that they're patriotic. There may be some sarcasm tucked into that. That would be my guess. <laughs> now here's the part, of, if you're going to look at anything in, the, in this whole story that I think is really important, it's going to be this. The boys at first were very polite about my medals and asked me what I had got done to get them. I showed them the papers which were written in very beautiful language and full of two, two really nice words there. But at the bottom they mean brotherhood and self-denial. Okay? He said, but which was but which really said, with the adjectives removed, that I had been given the medals because I was an American. So what does he point out? Did he get them for bravery? No. no. He's an American who's wounded, serving in Italy. That's it. Okay? So they gave him a, What do you think the Italian soldiers had to do? Same thing? They really did something. He got it just for, for no reason. Now, here's the key. Hemingway, not the narrator, Hemingway, is sneaking a thing about writing in here. About how you add adjectives and stuff into your writing, and you'll notice as you look at, it, at Hemingway's stuff, he doesn't use a lot of them. Faulkner's going to use a ton. But Hemingway's pointing out, you take the adjectives out, stuff's not really as flowery or as impressive as it looks. So his idea would be, don't have a bunch of adjectives. Have, just say what you need to say. There's no reason to put all this fluff on something. Just pick the right word. Pick a strong word for it. I like that. I really do. There was a teacher at a local school who's, I don't know their name, but, and I won't say what school, but they used to give bonus points to students on papers. for how, They give an extra one point on each thing for however many adjectives they would use in, uh, you know, beyond a certain number that they required. That is stupid writing. All right, that's just asking somebody to, you know, put nine adjectives in front of a noun, and that is just asking for garbage writing. Okay, that's not descriptive. That's pointless. <laughs> that's not being economical with words. Hemingway hated that. All right. He says, after that, their manner changed a little toward me, although I was their friend against outsiders. 
I was a friend, but I never really was one of them after they had read, been read the citations because it had been different with them and they had done very different things to get their medals. I had been wounded, it was true, but we all knew that being wounded after all was really an accident. You know, that's again one of those disillusionment points. He's like, getting wounded doesn't mean anything except, you know, you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, is the point he's making, which is kind of a depressing statement. But he notices, he says, now we're not ever, we're friends against other people. So like if the four of us are friends and we come up against these three, we're all together. But when it's just the four of us, now it's them against me. So, you know, it's kind of like he realizes, once again, I'm alone. There's a lot of loneliness in Hemingway's writing. So I was never ashamed of the ribbons, though, and sometimes after the cocktail hour, I would imagine myself having done all the things they had done to get their medals, but walking home at night through the empty streets with the cold wind and all the shops closed, trying to keep near the street lights, I knew that I would never have done such things, and I was very much afraid to die, and often lay in bed at night by myself, afraid to, uh, afraid, sorry, afraid to die and wondering how I would be when I went back to the front again. Notice the loneliness again I mentioned. Do what? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Hemingway always struggled with this. I mean, he was like severe with this and he started at a young age. The fact he lived as long as he did to me is really impressive. I do believe that alcohol is what pushed him that final step. Alcohol is a depressant and he drank enough of it to be beyond depressed, okay? So I think that really is what pushes him over the edge. Um, so the three with the medals were like, uh, sorry, were like hunting hawks, and I was not a hawk, although I might seem like a hawk to those who had never hunted. They, the three, knew better, and so we drifted apart. And I honestly think that's a little bit of him bleeding through, too. You know, they, he looks the part, but he's not really. That was Hemingway. You know, he looked the part like this tough, manly man, but I don't think that was really the whole story with this guy. He says, but I stayed good friends with the boy who had been wounded his first day on the front because he would never know how he would have turned out. So he could never be accepted either. And I liked him because I thought perhaps he would not have turned out to be a hawk either. He's like, I make friends with this guy because we're both kind of maybe cowards. So the major, now we're going to come back to that major now. Big change in him. The major who had been the great fencer did not believe in bravery and spent much of his time while we sat in the machines correcting my grammar. That is the most loaded sentence in this whole thing. Okay? That's why you have to get used to it. If you're going to read Hemingway, you're going to read writers like him, you've got to look for sentences like this. The major, and it, what, what sticks out is there are things that don't fit, okay? The major doesn't believe in bravery. How can you be a soldier and not believe in bravery? Now, you would think that's something you would believe in. He doesn't, but what does he spend all his time worrying about? Grammar, what a pointless thing to stress over. You know, I don't believe in bravery, but I do believe in correct grammar. And that's coming from a military guy. Now, I understand why you might not believe in bravery, okay? Maybe he's seen enough fighting to realize that Soldiers, if it's done right, they train you to be brave. It doesn't mean you're necessarily brave on the surface. You might be, but a lot of that is just like instincts. They're trying to build that in you. Where, you know, normally, if you were at home and this happened, you probably wouldn't have reacted that way, but out there on the field, you will. So maybe that's why he disagrees, but why worry about something that's so completely pointless? At the, I mean, it just feels like it is. He, it says the English teacher, right? He had complimented me on how I spoke Italian, and we talked together very easily. One day I had said that the Italian seemed such an easy language to me that I could not take much great interest in it. Everything was so easy to say, ah, yeah, to say, sorry. Ah, yes, the major said. Why then do you not take up the use of grammar? So he took up the use of grammar, and soon Italian was such a difficult language that I was afraid to talk to him until I had the grammar straight in my mind. That's really key, too. He's like, I thought this was easy, you know, and I loved doing it. I just didn't care. You know, it's just, it seemed, and I would talk to him in Italian, and then he started trying to teach me the grammar of it. And all of a sudden, it became really difficult, and I quit. Okay, you know, it's that. It, that's kind of an interesting statement about how you know originally when we think things are easy, maybe sometimes we just be left alone and enjoy it rather than people trying to tweak it. Okay, think about it in sports. We talked about this earlier. If you know you're out there swinging a bat and you're swinging it completely weird, but you're you're it's working for you, but you got that guy that comes up and's like a hitting instructor or something that changes up your form. And so good luck striking out the next 30 times in a row until you get it right. Okay, and maybe that helps down the road if you're like, you know, in Little League and you're swinging like, you know, this. Okay, I get it. All right, but, you know, at the level you're, you guys are at now, I mean, you know, there's no reason to, to mess with it and you spend half the season batting 150 because you're trying to swing a certain way or even golf, anything like that, tennis. Uh, when I play tennis, I, um, I have my finger out on my racket. You're not supposed to do that. I'll swing it like this. It helps give me better control and kind of like so I know like kind of where I'm pointing to do it. If I was playing against somebody who was like, you know, a pro, that would probably break my stinking finger. I don't play against pros. I play against a bunch of high school kids who've never touched a racket before. I'm not worried about that. 
So, you know, same thing with like, you know, again, like uh, swimming. Somebody's like, oh, you know, you need to do the swim, the, the stroke just like this. Hey, I'm not competing against anybody. Here's what I need to do, not drown. And if I'm doing just fine like this, I don't need to do it like that, okay? So again, the, the fact that he's they're trying to tweak the smallest details is, is a problem, okay? All right, let's see what happens with this major, though. It says, the major, the major came very regularly to the hospital. I do not think he ever missed a day, although I'm sure he did not believe in the machines. All right, I'm rolling low on time. Let me kind of sh shorten this up. The major's happy. He comes every day. He doesn't believe in the machines, but he shows up. All of a sudden, he's going to snap on this guy and start yelling at him. If you look at the top of 805, he says, uh, I will go to the States. That's, um, that's uh, the narrator talking. Uh, are you married? That's the Italian. No, but I hope to be. The more of a fool you are, he said. He seemed very angry. That's not you guys. A man must not marry. And he's going he's gonna to complain about marriage. He's going to say, and keep going down a little further, he says he should find things he cannot lose. Now, that should be a warning sign when the guy's like, you shouldn't get married because you should find things you, sh you can't lose. Um, well, or he's lost his wife somehow. Uh, he's going to say that several times. He'll say he'll lose it. He'll lose it again. And then he disappears for a moment. Then he comes back. The major does. And he says to the guy, I would not be rude. My wife has just died. You must forgive me. So he's lost his wife. Flip over to the last page. Look at the very last paragraph. It says, The doctor told me that the major's wife, who was very young and whom he had not married until he was definitely invalided out of the war, had died of pneumonia. She had been sick only a few days. No one expected her to die. Look at the irony here. He didn't marry her until he knew he wasn't going back to war because he was worried he'd die at the war and she'd be a widow. Then she gets sick and dies out of the blue. All right, and again, that's what's made him just, not only does he not believe in these machines, he doesn't believe in much of anything anymore. All right, a lot of Hemingway's war stuff is built around capturing that sense of disillusionment and this idea that life's just not fair, okay? Can you see that from what we saw about his biography? Very, very on point. point. Is pneumonia still that, like, dangerous? Uh, it's still dangerous, especially if you're older, but she's yeah. young. When you're your age, dying from pneumonia is a lot rarer. So, all right, well, that'll get us through. Y'all, I'm going to go ahead and pack up. That would be so sad. Like, you waited.